So what is going on everyone, Fernando Silva here with another video, and over the past couple days and weeks we've accumulated a decent amount of new subscribers, so if you're new to the channel, welcome, and if you've been around for a while, thank you for supporting for so long, but today we're going to be talking about the M1 iPad Pro. I've had this M1 iPad Pro since day one, so I believe it was May 20th when I received it, so it's been about a month since we've been using this M1 iPad Pro as my main computing device, and I want to give you guys my synopsis and my overall thoughts, and then finally recommend at the end of the video whether or not it's a good buy in 2021. But without further ado, let's get it going. I wanna make this video as easy as possible to navigate, so we're gonna break this video down into six sections, right? We're gonna talk about the iPad Pro design, the performance, the hardware, the software, then what I personally use the iPad Pro for, and then finally, whether or not the M1 iPad Pro is worth it in 2021. So to actually get this started off, let's talk about the design itself. So the design of the M1 2021 iPad Pro is nothing crazy. The design is exactly the same as a 2020 iPad Pro. You still have the same camera bump, the same footprint. Everything is exactly the same. The only real physical difference that I see is that the, the grills, the speaker grills on the M1 iPad Pro, there's less of them, but there are, there are wider holes. I don't know if that's gonna make a difference in terms of like the actual sound that comes out of it, but that's the only physical difference that I saw. And then also, the M1 iPad Pro is 0.5 millimeters thicker to accommodate A, the mini LED display, and they probably added a little bit more battery in there to also power that mini LED display, but we'll get into that in a second. And then if you guys are still worried about the actual iPad being a little too thick for your older Magic Keyboard, don't worry at all, I have a paper-like screen protector on it at all times, and then I even use a Pataka case on it sometimes, and still zero issues with my older Magic Keyboard in terms of connectivity, and even closing flush. So the iPad will fit in the older Magic Keyboard no problem, and it'll sit flush, and if you're worried about putting a screen protector on it or a D-brand skin, by all means throw it on there and it'll still work, it'll still fit, and it'll still fit flush when closed. So don't lose sleep thinking you're gonna have to buy a new Magic Keyboard for your new M1 iPad Pro. So like I said, from a design standpoint, everything stayed the same. Even, you know, the cameras on the front stayed in the same location, which I know that we wanted it in that landscape mode, but we're not gonna get that because the Apple Pencil is still charged in the same area. So overall, the design is identical, except for that 0.5 millimeters of extra thickness, which isn't an issue whatsoever. And it's supposedly a tiny bit heavier, and you do notice it a little bit, but it's minuscule, the amount. It's like grams of in terms of weight. So now let's talk about the performance of this new M1 iPad Pro because they did slap that new M1 chip which has been amazing on these MacBook Airs and MacBook Pros and Mac Minis. So everybody thought that this new M1 was gonna be amazing on the iPad Pro. And before you start kinda going at me and screaming at me and saying that the software's holding it down, we'll get there. But the actual M1 on the iPad Pro with eight gigabytes of RAM because I have the base model iPad Pro, is actually a big improvement over the 2018 iPad Pro. And the biggest avenue that I saw that improvement is in RAM management, obviously, right? And multitasking management. So with the 2018 iPad Pro, I used to use Apple Arcade, or I still use Apple Arcade, and played 2K a lot, right? From a function standpoint and playability standpoint, 2K ran perfectly on the 2018 iPad Pro. No issues, I would play you know, for a couple hours on end, it would never freeze or anything. But the moment I left the application to check an email or a text or something on YouTube and came back to NBA 2K, the game would reset, right? It would reload, it would respawn, whatever you guys wanna call it. But with the 2021 M1 iPad Pro, that doesn't happen. It's been my like 20th app that I haven't opened in about three days and I'm in the middle of an actual game. I just open up the app again, I'm plopped right back into my game. All I have to do is connect my Xbox controller to the iPad and I start playing again, which is something that was not happening ever. Like not a single time did the 2018 iPad Pro manage that RAM correctly enough to save that game for me versus the M1 iPad Pro has. Now again, I know that I'm talking about a game use case, but think about other applications like Word or LumaFusion or things that are more uh, business impactful to you where you're in the middle of something, but you gotta check an email and then you go back and it reloads and you lose your save data, then that's a bigger issue with RAM management and the M1 iPad Pro alleviates that even with the eight gigabyte base model. So yes, Apple didn't give us crazy software improvements, but the M1 iPad Pro is gonna give you better efficiency. Everything is a little bit snappier. Not that the 2018 or the 2020 aren't snappy, but I did see some efficiency gains with the M1 iPad Pro with apps opening instantly, multitasking being no problem, RAM management being much, much better on the M1 iPad Pro just because they're gonna handle more. So overall performance, if you, again, Let's avoid the whole software talk for now, but if you were to go one-to-one -one from the 2018 to the 2021 iPad Pro, yes, you're gonna see performance and efficiency gains, obviously, because we're putting an M1 chip into the iPad Pro. So if you guys are not, if you guys are worried that maybe the performance isn't enough, you do see, I would say, significant performance and impactful improvements on the iPad Pro with the M1. 
Okay, so now let's talk about software, right? Let's talk about iPadOS 15. Because even with my performance conversation from the last topic, I'm using iPadOS 15 beta 1, and it's still very snappy. That Apple Arcade situation with 2K that I told you about is still on iPadOS 15 beta 1. So the M1 chip on the iPad Pro has been able to take this iPadOS 15 beta 1 and run it very smoothly. I would almost recommend it for most people to just put it on there on their main device, but I don't want to have that kind of liability. And then you guys come back at me and say, hey, my iPad Pro is glitching all over the place, but I personally have had a great experience with iPadOS 15 Beta 1. And again, yes, the software is very limiting. It's a funnel, it's a bottleneck, right? There's issues when it comes to being a pro device on iPadOS 15. And they made some improvements to multitasking, sort of. It's a little bit better, I would say. It's definitely a little bit of an improvement because it makes you want to use multitasking a little bit more with those gestures that I was showing in other videos where you can pull down to go to multitasking. But other than that, we were expecting, you know, secondary monitor support or a real version of that, some sort of pro-level multitasking with floating windows. And we got none of that, right? So yes, iPadOS 15 is very limiting to the iPad Pro, but I'm hoping with iterations, it'll get a little bit better better and we'll get closer to that you know laptop desktop type experience that we want out of the iPad Pro because what my perfect vision is is I want them to bring over a pro level multitasking or a pro level you know secondary display support I'm calling it pro level which you know secondary display support is so um, what's the word I'm looking for so common or such an it's been around for forever on laptops and, and desktops obviously but what I want Apple to do is to bring something that's very familiar to secondary display or floating windows. So when people do actually go into it, they're like, hey, this is something that I know how to use, but still be unique enough where it's unique to the iPad and it's not a one-to-one -one copy from you know Windows or Mac OS, right? I don't want Mac OS on the iPad. I just want it to be its own operating system with a little bit more of pro functionality. So that's my thoughts on the software in a nutshell. Yes, iPadOS 15 brought a bunch of new features and if you guys I'll post my link down below on my review on iPadOS 15 or the top features that were announced and then also some secret ones that I found in there because iPadOS does have a lot of good things and we, we have to remember that Apple didn't promise us they were going to put macOS on the iPad Pro just because they put the M1 chip in. That's all speculation that we create internally and we wish we want more but hey, little by little Apple will give us something that's I think worth waiting. So overall my thoughts on the software, yes it's a bottleneck but yes it's getting incrementally better and eventually I think Apple's gonna give us what we want. It's just a matter of how long that's gonna take. So now let's talk about the hardware of the M1 iPad Pro because yes, from a design standpoint, they look identical to the 2020 iPad Pro and then even very similar from a footprint standpoint from the 2018 iPad Pro. But there's actually a couple things that they added on the M1 that's actually very beneficial to workflows and things like that. So the first thing that they added was a Thunderbolt port and they replaced the USB-C port. So with Thunderbolt, now we get up to 40 gigabytes of data pass through. You can use Thunderbolt docks. Thunderbolt SSDs, which is just much faster data transfer, and then also the ability to use things like the Pro Display XDR and be able to use a 6K monitor with your iPad Pro. Now, I don't know who's gonna buy a $5,000 screen for their $1,000 tablet, but it's a possibility now with Thunderbolt. And the place that I saw Thunderbolt really take advantage of is I have a RAV Power USB-C SSD, right? It's known for doing, you know, max of 500 megabytes per second or 540 megabytes per second. And with a Thunderbolt port, what it does is it maximizes that, right? So if you were using just a USB-C port, with, which is what the 2018 and the 2020 and the iPad Air 4 have, it's gonna go probably midway through that 540 megabyte transfer speed, right? When using a USB-C SSD. But when, you're, when you plug in a USB-C SSD to a Thunderbolt, it's almost like hitting the, the turbo button on that, right? So you're pretty much getting a very optimized version of data transfer, even if you're using a technology that isn't Thunderbolt. So that's why I love the Thunderbolt port because it's helped transfer data speeds with my SSD, my RAV power, because I don't have a Thunderbolt 4 dock or Thunderbolt 4 like SSD. At one point we'll get one once we need it, but for now it's making everything better, even though the technology isn't, isn't even there. So the Thunderbolt port was a very welcome addition. And then the other thing that they added was a mini LED display. You have that new ProMotion XDR display. It's actually really, really nice. It gets very bright. You have that 1000 nit brightness, the 1600 peak nit brightness, which I don't even know if I've gotten to that point, but the screen is very bright. There is a difference. There's, you could only really see the difference if you look at them side by side. And if the M1 iPad Pro is your first iPad Pro, then it's gonna be amazing. But then if the 2018 is your first iPad Pro, that's also gonna be an amazing screen. So you can only really tell the difference side by side. And the biggest differences are that the blacks are just way darker. They're way, way darker, almost to the point where they're OLED dark, not quite. But you can see if I put them side by side that the 2018 iPad Pro, it has kind of like a whitish hue behind it because it's an LCD screen, right? And mini LED alleviates all of that. So the contrast ratios are way higher. You have 10,000 mini LEDs, 2,500 dimming zones. 
So overall, it's a great screen. And there was that blooming issue and there still has, and that blooming issue will persist. It's basically that the screen is too bright for its own good. And when you have such a contrasty screen, let's say, you know, white text on a black background, yes, it's gonna bleed through because it's the screen is just so bright and there's so many LEDs in there that's gonna bleed through a little bit. So if you just avoid those situations and the only time that it really happens is if you're in a super dark room with the brightness all the way up. And usually when you're in a dark room, your brightness is a little bit lower because you don't need the brightness all the way up. So the amount of times that that's gonna affect you, I think it's gonna be pretty low. And honestly, until I wrote that in the script for this video, I forgot all about the blooming effects on the iPad Pro. And now let's quickly talk about how I personally use my iPad Pro, because my iPad Pro I use for pretty much everything, right? I answer a lot of emails, I use a lot of Excel sheets now, very minimal Excel sheets, I'm not doing pivot tables and stuff like that, so I'm sorry for all those Excel users that want to use their Excel on the iPad Pro. I'm still trying to learn all that stuff, but again, I pretty much manage the entire YouTube channel from here. I answer comments, look at all my data analytics, I edit all my videos with LumaFusion on here. I record all my videos on my iPhone and then airdrop them over to the iPad Pro over there. So the iPad Pro is my end-all be-all. And then I also use it for Microsoft Office as well, right? For Word documents, PowerPoint presentations, uh, like I said, Excel documents, right? Being able to use OneDrive and things like that. So this machine, as long as you're willing to learn maybe a different way to get from point A to point B, and the learning curve is very small, you can do pretty much everything on the iPad Pro. Pretty much everything. The only thing, again, that's bottlenecking my iPad Pro experience is the fact that I can't have like eight PowerPoint presentations open at the same time and kind of manipulate all the data and stuff and copy and paste stuff over because that that situation isn't as isn't efficient yet on the iPad Pro or as efficient as it would be, you know, on a secondary display with a MacBook Air. When that time comes, this MacBook Air will not be needed for me anymore, and hopefully that time comes pretty soon. But that's pretty much what I use the iPad Pro for everything from leisure to travel to work to planning to notes to note taking with my apple pencil to thumbnail creation you name it it's all done on the ipad pro with no issues whatsoever and i built this channel on the 2018 ipad pro and the iphone so the thing is a beast and then lastly should you buy this ipad pro in 2021 right the m1 ipad pro the 1100 dollars 128 gig 8 gigs of ram ipad pro And the, I mean, the answer is kind of simple. Like if you are the person that needs a mini LED and you need Thunderbolt, then yes, this iPad Pro is 100% for you. And you know who you are. Like that mini LED, if that's gonna have a business impact and a tangible impact on your life, then by all means, that mini LED is the only thing that you can get it on. So you can only get it on this M1 iPad Pro, get the iPad Pro, the iPad Pro is for you. But for everybody else, right? For everybody else that doesn't need mini LED, that doesn't need the M1, that doesn't need eight gigs of RAM, you don't need this M1 iPad Pro. You can go a 2018 model, a 2020 model, you can get an iPad Air 4. And if you just want something to, to take notes and watch movies, get the literal $330 base model iPad, the 10.2 version. As long as you're okay with the older aesthetic of the home button, that's gonna be plenty. Because remember, iPad OS 15 runs across all of those devices. And Apple for right now isn't breaking that down in terms of, hey, iPad OS 15 on the Pro is gonna do these features and iPad OS on the regular iPad isn't gonna have those features. Right now it's universal across all devices. So pretty much anything you can do on the 10.2 iPad, you're gonna be able to do on the iPad Pro. It's just a matter of how fast you want that task done. Pretty much is what that spectrum in that lineup of iPads is. So again, I don't highly recommend this iPad Pro. If you need 5G, if you need mini LED, and if you need the M1, then yes, you know who you are and get this iPad Pro. But other than that, I recommend getting a refurbished 2020 or a refurbished 2018, or if you really want the M1 and you don't care about the mini LED display, then get the $800 11 inch M1 because that's just as powerful as this one, just no mini LED display, but you save $300. So again, my two cents is hold off for now, wait for iPadOS to become a little bit more mature or iPadOS 15 to become more mature because then they'll ideally take advantage of the M1 power. But until then, the A12X, the A12Z, the A10Z, or whatever those are called on the iPads and iPad minis, they're gonna work fine for iPadOS and your iPadOS experience. But yeah, that's pretty much gonna do it for this video, everybody. Hopefully you guys learned a little bit and I was able to help you make a purchasing decision on deciding which iPad to get because at the end of the day, most people know who they are if they want this iPad Pro and everybody else should not get this iPad Pro because it's expensive and the iPadOS software is bottlenecking it and for $1,100, I'm gonna recommend a student or anybody else that needs to get work done to get a MacBook Air because macOS isn't bottlenecked like iPadOS. But that's my two cents. Like I said, hopefully you guys enjoyed. Don't forget to like, comment, subscribe. You guys are awesome. If you guys made it to the end, comment that you guys are legends. Until next time, peace.